June 6th, 1991, Greenford, England. While leaving her family's home, 43-year-old Penny Bell tells a group of builders that she is running late for an appointment. Later that morning, Penny is discovered dead inside her vehicle at a car park after being stabbed 50 times. Three days before her death, Penny had withdrawn 8,500 pounds from her bank account, but the money is never found and no one knows the reasons for Penny's withdrawal or her mysterious appointment with her unknown killer. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest mini-sode of The Trail Went Cold. I'm your host Robin Warder, and I am pleased to say that we will be traveling across the Atlantic to cover a mystery from the United Kingdom, the 1991 murder of Penny Bell. I know that I have a lot of devoted listeners in the UK, and I've only covered one case from your part of the world thus far, the disappearance of Rini and Andrew McRae. So I thought it was about time I paid you fine folks a visit again, and I selected a pretty baffling unsolved murder. This case seems to be pretty infamous in England, though I'm not sure how well known it is in North America. I'm always fascinated by mysteries where a victim is murdered after traveling to a location they had no real reason to be at. Here's Penny Bell, a loving wife and mother who doesn't seem to have any dark secrets, yet she withdraws a bunch of money from her bank account and leaves her house one morning for an appointment. Nobody has any idea what this appointment was for, yet Penny wound up crossing paths with someone who decided to stab her 50 times in a public place. Given how brazen this crime was, it's something of a miracle that no one's ever been caught. But hopefully, maybe featuring this case on our podcast will bring a stroke of good fortune. However, before we get started, just a brief reminder that The Trail Went Cold is a weekly podcast which alternates between our regular full-length episodes and shorter mini-sodes like this one. We deliver either a new full-length episode or a new mini-sode every Wednesday. We're currently available for download on several platforms, including iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play Music, so if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it. The Trail Went Cold also has its own PayPal account and a donate button on the website. If there's anyone out there who wants to make a donation, we would greatly appreciate it, and we'll be sure to give you a shout-out on a future episode. We've had quite a few new donors this week, but before I name them, I just want to mention that this will be the last time we thank our donors during the introduction of our episodes. We've been receiving so many generous contributions lately that we don't want to needlessly prolong our intros and take forever to begin our stories. So starting next week, we will be thanking our donors at the end of our episodes. So this week, we've had two listeners named Keisha and Sean sign up for recurring monthly donations, and we've also received contributions from Shireen, Steve, Aaron, Christy, and Georgia. So a huge thanks to all you wonderful people. And incidentally, Georgia happens to be a friend of ours who hosts her very own podcast, so if you like experimental music, be sure to check out her show, Array to Z. And also, we are just over three weeks away from CrimeCon, which is taking place at the JW Marriott Hotel in Indianapolis from June 9th to the 11th, and yours truly will be appearing at the event on Podcast Row, representing The Trail Went Cold. You probably heard last week that our podcast won a private party giveaway from CrimeCon, and that anyone who used our special 20% off promo code to purchase tickets is invited to attend. I can now tell you that this party will be taking place on Friday, June 9th from 6 to 7 p.m. I'm already planning some surprises, and will continue sharing more details as they become available. Unfortunately, there will be limited space at this party, but I'm already brainstorming alternative potential ideas for those of you listeners who cannot attend. Anyway, if you still want to travel to CrimeCon, but have not yet purchased tickets, you can visit CrimeCon.com and receive a 20% discount by entering the promo code TTWC20. That's TTWC20. I hope to see many of you folks there, and I cannot wait to meet you. So with all that out of the way, let us now travel to the United Kingdom to profile the unsolved murder of Penny Bell. Our story begins in England in 1991. Our central figure is 43-year-old Ruth Penelope Bell, who goes by the name Penny. Penny lives in the village of Dedham with her husband, Alistair, and their two children, an 11-year-old son named Matthew and a 9-year-old daughter named Lauren. She is a successful businesswoman who helps run a catering employment agency in the Kilburn District of London. On the morning of June 6th, Penny's husband is away at work and her children are at school, while a group of builders are doing some extensive renovations on the family's home. At around 9.40 a.m., Penny left her home in her Jaguar XJS and told the builders that she was running late for a 9.50 appointment. Unfortunately, sometime within the next hour or so, Penny Bell would be brutally murdered. At around noon, Penny's Jaguar was discovered in the car park of the Gurnell Leisure Centre in the Greenford suburb of London. Her body was in the driver's seat, slumped over the steering wheel. She had been stabbed and slashed a total of 50 times in the chest and arms. 
The forensic evidence suggested that the assailant stabbed Penny several times from the passenger side, exited the vehicle, and then walked over to the driver's side to stab her some more. It was estimated that she had been dead since around 10.30, and believe it or not, the Jaguar's hazard lights were flashing the entire time it was parked there, and its windscreen wipers were running. Two women noticed Penny sitting upright in the front seat when they arrived at the leisure center at 11 o'clock, but just assumed she was sleeping. They did not actually go over to check the vehicle and discover Penny's body until they returned to the car park one hour later. The most curious clue was that some design samples from her bedroom were laid out on display on the console between the driver's and passenger seats. Even though it seemed like a crime of passion, no apparent motive could be found, as Penny was not sexually assaulted and her handbag was left behind at the scene. It wasn't long before some disturbing eyewitness sightings emerged. Witnesses recalled seeing Penny's Jaguar driving very slowly along Greenford Road sometime after 10. Its hazard lights were flashing and the windscreen wipers were running, even though there was no rain that day. Penny had an unidentified male passenger in her car, and it appeared that she was trying to pull over to the side of the road, but the passenger grabbed the wheel and forced her to keep driving. It seemed like the hazard lights and the windscreen wipers were an attempt to signal for help. One witness would even recall seeing Penny driving the Jaguar into the Leisure Center car park while silently mouthing the words help me out the window, but unfortunately, this witness did nothing to intervene. An e-fit facial composite was created for Penny's male passenger, who was described as being around 40 years old, having dark hair, and wearing a bracelet on his right hand, and he may have possibly had a beard. But none of the witnesses got a good enough look at him for their descriptions to stand out. Anyway, the most likely theory was that Penny had gone to meet this man for her 950 appointment, but the problem was that nobody, not even Penny's own husband, knew about this appointment, or had any idea what it was for. A search of Penny's diary showed no record of this appointment, even though she was usually very meticulous about keeping records about this sort of thing. It was Penny's routine to go straight from her home to her office in Kilburn in the morning, but that drive took over 30 minutes, so if she was leaving at 9.40, it's doubtful this 9.50 appointment was scheduled to take place in her office. And Greenford was off of Penny's usual route to work, so it seemed very unusual for her to travel elsewhere for a separate appointment. The Gurnell Leisure Center was located 9 miles from Penny's home, and her family claimed they'd never been there before. One possible theory was that Penny's appointment was the result of a last-minute phone call, but none of the builders recalled hearing the phone ring at the house that morning. There was also speculation that this appointment was somehow related to the design samples from Penny's bedroom, which were laid out on display inside the Jaguar. However, a surprising discovery threw the whole case for a loop. It turned out that three days before her murder, Penny had withdrawn £8,500 from the joint bank account she shared with her husband, Alistair. She never told Alistair about this, and the money was never found. Once again, even though Penny was very meticulous with her record-keeping, she kept no record of this withdrawal or any upcoming financial transactions which would involve £8,500. Even though Penny's handbag was left behind in her vehicle, could the missing £8,500 have been taken from there? Well, given that no one ever came forward to admit having an appointment with Penny that morning, investigators became convinced she must have known her killer. Alistair Bell was questioned, but he had an alibi that morning and was immediately ruled out as a suspect. Sadly, it sounds like Alistair was absolutely devastated by the ordeal, and he went into a deep depression. In fact, he never really recovered, and eventually became estranged from his two children after telling them that he couldn't do love anymore. The case took a bizarre turn in 1992, when a man named John Richmond shocked everyone by contacting the tabloid newspaper, The Sun, and telling them he was with Penny at the time of her murder, and would reveal the full story if they paid him £80,000. Richmond was a family friend of the Bells, and he claimed that Penny was murdered by a contract killer. Now here's something frustrating. The wording in the one article I found which talks about this is a bit murky. It reads, He claimed Penny was the victim of a contract killer, and he was the mystery person Penny set out to meet. Richmond said they were having a secret relationship, and met to discuss sleeping together. So, does this mean Penny had a secret relationship and a meeting with the contract killer? Or is the article referring to Richmond? Whatever the case, Richmond was arrested after his fingerprints were found in Penny's Jaguar, but he was soon released. Being a family friend, I guess there could have been an innocent explanation for how Richmond's prints wound up in the vehicle. There was no other evidence to tie him to the crime, and police are not sure if they lend much credence to his story. Police have also interviewed notorious murderer and rapist Robert Knapper, who is currently incarcerated in a psychiatric hospital for the 1993 murders of a woman named Samantha Bassett and her four-year-old daughter, Jasmine. After his conviction, Napper was linked to the 1992 murder of a woman named Rachel Nickel and has been looked at as a possible suspect in other unsolved crimes, including the murder of Penny Bell. The reason Napper seems like a promising candidate is because Rachel Nickel was stabbed 49 times in front of her two-year-old son. He definitely sounds like a man who would be capable of stabbing Penny 50 times, but no evidence has ever been found to link Napper to the crime. Anyway... Even though a substantial reward has been offered for information, the murder has continued to remain unsolved for nearly 26 years. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. Wow. 
This is an absolutely horrifying crime, but it's also a complete puzzler. This has numerous similarities to the murder of Matt Flores, an equally baffling case I covered on this podcast two months ago. Number one, both these murders took place in a public parking lot in broad daylight. Number two, no one has any idea what the motive for these crimes might be. And number three, given the circumstances, there is no logical way the killer should have been able to get away with this. One of the most tragic aspects of Penny's murder is how preventable it was, as multiple witnesses saw her struggling with a male passenger as she was driving, and one of them literally saw her mouthing the words, help me, yet nobody did anything about this. And it sounds like Penny was lying dead in her vehicle for about an hour and a half before anybody called the police. This case sounds like a pretty horrifying example of the bystander effect. But here's the most mind-blowing part. Penny's killer stabbed her 50 times, meaning that he had to be just covered in blood as he fled the scene through a public parking lot in broad daylight. Yet nobody saw the guy. It's almost like the entire world just stopped while this person murdered Penny and then disappeared forever. I'm just trying to figure out how this whole thing could have unfolded. We have eyewitness accounts of Penny driving down the road while struggling with a male passenger, so she must have met up with her killer at another unknown location before he forced her to drive into the parking lot of the Gurnell Leisure Center. But how did this guy get away? If he originally met Penny at another location, would he have a vehicle parked at the Leisure Center? Did he have an accomplice who drove him away from the scene? Because with the amount of blood the killer must have had on him, I just don't know how he managed to escape undetected without a vehicle. So let's assume Penny's killer used this 950 appointment as a means to lure her to her death. What would this so-called appointment have been for in the first place? Given that bedroom design samples were on display in the Jaguar, did the killer feign interest in them in order to convince Penny to show up? Possibly, but that doesn't account for the missing 8,500 pounds Penny withdrew from her joint bank account. Since she never told her husband about this, or kept a record of the transaction, it's easy to assume that something shady was going on at this meeting. This could have been a blackmail or extortion attempt, but things went horribly wrong, and someone decided to murder Penny. Given that this money has never been found, I have to believe Penny brought it with her and that it was taken. There have been numerous blackmail theories, one of which involves Alistair Bell. We know Alistair was cleared as a suspect, but he was bisexual and had been involved in a long-term relationship with a man before he married Penny. Some people have speculated that Alistair might have been carrying on a secret affair with another man and that the killer was blackmailing Penny about it. But I don't know, investigators never uncovered any evidence that Alistair was engaged in any secret extramarital affairs. Furthermore, it doesn't sound like Alistair's bisexuality was some big secret, as he was willing to share this with both the police and the media. In fact, the man Alistair had previously been in a relationship with was actually a guest at his wedding to Penny, so I don't think this type of thing would have been a shocking enough secret to compel Penny to pay someone 8,500 pounds. Now, if the murder has nothing to do with Alistair, then it's possible that Penny was the one who was having an affair and paying someone off to keep quiet. If her appointment just happened to be with her secret lover, and she told him she wasn't planning to leave her husband, this could have inspired enough rage for him to stab her 50 times. However, no evidence has ever been found to suggest Penny was having an affair, and there's one major reason why Alistair believes that wasn't the case. When Penny left the house, she told the builders about her 950 appointment. If there was something secretive going on at this appointment which Penny didn't want people to know about, why mention it to the builders at all? Why not just say, I'm running late for work? Well, investigators do have one alternative explanation. Maybe Penny didn't have an appointment at all, but just said she had one as an excuse to end her conversation with the builders. And that's a valid point. I'm sure all of us go through this situation in our daily lives. Sometimes we'll be stuck in a conversation with someone who just won't shut up, so we'll say something like, oh, I'd love to chat, but I'm running late for an appointment. We're not actually running late, of course, but we're just using this as a polite way to end the conversation and get away from them. So who's to say Penny didn't do something like that here? That being said, the one piece of evidence which suggests that Penny's 950 appointment might have been legitimate are the bedroom design samples which were on display in her vehicle. This seems to go against the idea that Penny was meeting someone to pay off blackmail money. So maybe someone really did set up an appointment with Penny at the last minute, which is why she never told anybody about it. But if that was the case, why did she withdraw the 8,500 pounds three days beforehand? Well, let's look at possible suspects. I know police question Robert Knapper, but I have my doubts he's the killer. The overkill aspect of Penny's murder does match Knapper's MO, and if she just happened to cross paths with Knapper that day, and the crime was completely random, then I could see him being responsible. However, this particular murder seems a bit too calculated for him. Napper is a mentally ill, paranoid schizophrenic, and does not seem like someone who would go to the trouble of luring Penny to a prearranged meeting and asking her to bring 85 pounds. So I don't think Napper had anything to do with this, and I believe the killing was a lot more personal. The only other major suspect has been John Richmond, who claimed he knew the truth about Penny's murder and tried to sell the story to the tabloids. He was briefly arrested because his fingerprints were found in Penny's Jaguar, but given that he was a family friend, this was hardly enough evidence to build a case against him. One article I found about Richmond mentioned that he was a builder, though I'm not entirely sure if this meant he was one of the builders working on Penny's home at the time she was killed. I wish I had more info on Richmond, but it doesn't like investigators ever found any corroborating evidence to support his story about a contract killer and a secret affair. So until I hear otherwise, 
I'm just going to assume this guy was nothing more than a sleazy opportunist who wanted to capitalize on the tragedy and tried to make some money by selling a false story to the tabloids. So, overall, this one is definitely a real head-scratcher. Nothing about this crime makes complete sense, and it's really difficult to form a concrete theory about what happened. I just cannot believe that this was a random crime. The fact that Penny was stabbed 50 times suggests something really personal. Remember, even after stabbing Penny several times from the passenger side, they still went to the trouble of exiting the vehicle, walking over to the driver's side, and stabbing her some more. That's a sign of some major hatred and rage. If it wasn't for the missing 8,500 pounds, I might be more willing to believe that Penny was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and cross paths with a mentally ill killer like Robert Knapper, who decided to stab Penny so viciously, even though she was a complete stranger. However, if Penny decided to withdraw a large amount of money from her joint bank account without telling her husband, didn't keep a record of this withdrawal, and then just happened to get murdered right after this transaction for a completely unrelated reason, then that would be one hell of a coincidence. No, I'm pretty certain she went to an appointment that morning to pay £8,500 to someone over something she didn't want anybody to know about. But this person forced Penny to drive to another location, brutally murdered her, and then took off with her money. I really have no idea what kind of skeletons Penny had in her closet for something like this to happen, but no matter how dark her secrets may have been, her family still deserves to know about them, so they can finally have some answers. Penny's daughter, Lauren, often gives interviews about this case, and is very open about sharing what a traumatic ordeal this has been for her and her family. She's willing to discuss all this in order to keep her mother's case in the spotlight, because she really wants to find out who killed her, and attain some closure. So if you have any information about the unsolved murder of Penny Bell, please contact the appropriate authorities. But if you just have your own theory about what happened, feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email at robin.warder at icloud.com. That's robin.warder at icloud.com. I want to thank all my supporters out there, especially those from the Unsolved Mysteries message board at the Sitcoms Online Forum and the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit. I need to provide my thanks to Miguel Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and Vince Nitro, who composes the music you hear on every episode. If you haven't already, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play Music. Like I mentioned earlier, we also have a donate button on our website, so if you want to express your appreciation for all the hard work we put into this podcast, we'd be extremely grateful. So have yourself a good week, and join me next Wednesday for a brand new episode of The Trail Went Cold. <laughs>